Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by welcoming you all to the Howard Theater for the first in-person memorial lecture of Fatima Mir. My name is Zen Mari. Um, I'm an artist and lecturer at Wits University. Uh, but more than that, it's a huge privilege to be your program director this evening um, because I'm Fatima Mir's grandson. And I've been working with the organizing committee um, of this lecture for the last two years. Um, and, and it's really an amazing effort on the part of the organizers for many years to get this platform started. So my role is to take you through a program this evening. Um, but I'd like to say a few opening remarks, if I may. So as the first in-person meeting of this memorial lecture, there was an online version last year. The lecture is still fresh. It's in its infancy. And I think that there's an importance there and a moment to think quite substantially about what such platforms as memorial lectures could offer. And in that reflection, what I especially mean is to think seriously about the tension that all memorial lectures have between paying homage or the commemorative aspect to a notable person, but also importantly being alive to the current contextual political urgencies of the time. Because if the ideas of the great people that have come before us are not extended to what we face today, then the sustainability of that project of paying homage becomes questionable, I would argue. So in this way, the work and legacy of Fatima Mir can and I think should be used as a framework or a platform or a way of opening out for furthering the ideas that she held dear and that she fought for but in ways that are forward-thinking and future-looking. From my reading of my grandmother's work, this is in the first instance a commitment to a critical project that questions power. It is a fearlessness of spirit and a selfless pledge to an activism, an activism that is young, youthful, femme-identifying, and black. I assert that she maintained these broad ideals and politics across the diverse work and activism she did in her life, not just in the institution, but outside, and that she carried on later, long, long into her later life. The speakers today, I believe, are alive to these challenges. Dr. Samim Dluli, Dr. Prashani Naidu, and Dr. Nanda Subban, who we look forward to hearing shortly, offer substantial contributions via ongoing creative political, academic, activist, and institutional work. And while these may begin with an elaboration of Fatima Mir's work and ideas, they importantly go beyond this as they address contemporary urgencies. And it is through this generous sharing of their ideas that we convene this critical space. So before we get to the, 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 the substance of the keynote and the respondents, um, I would like to first welcome um, Professor, I mean, Dr. Sifo Vuyokazi Shapli, who is going to give a welcome on behalf of the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Mkiz. Dr. Shapli. I hope I was a little bit taller. I think I'm a little bit shorter. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me greet you all and appreciate your presence. I have been introduced already, but I am here on behalf of our Deputy Vice Chancellor, um, Professor Antlantlam Kize, and I hope to do justice to the heart and the message that he wants all of you to embrace from the heart of our college and the university at large. 
Let me say, distinguished family and friends of Professor Fatima Mia. Keynote speak address that will be addressing us today. Dr. Same Mjoli. I like it because I had to ask. Everybody has been saying Sam. And I like, how do you pronounce your name and how do you say it out? And thank you for saying that. Discussants, as well as Auntie Elna Gandhi. Guests, staff, students, all protocol observed. As UKZN, we are privileged to have Prof. Mayer's grandson, <laughs> Zen Marie. I have experienced him in a short space of time. He loves life, I can tell. Much respect, I connected easily. Thank you for being our program director today. And having said that, I wanna also recognize Prof. Mia's grandniece, <laughs> my very own professor, Miriam Sadadi Khan. Prof, you've worked very hard and it has come home. You brought it with joy, you brought it with love. You brought it with respect, and here we are. Thank you so much. Recognizing Prof. Sidad Khan as the chair of our Memorial Lecture Committee. It is with immense pleasure and a profound honor that I extend a warm and a heartfelt welcome to all of you in the annual lecture of uh, Professor Fatima Mia. Today we pay tribute to a remarkable scholar, wow, activist, humanitarian, and celebrate the enduring legacy of Professor Fatima Mia. Our gathering comprises of an eclectic mix of individuals, each bring a unique perspective and insight to the memorial, to, sorry, to commemorate the life and contribution of the woman who left an indelible mark of the field of humanities and social justice and in the pursuit of knowledge. Even though I haven't met her in person, I feel I have met her in person because her legacy lives on. This lecture series now an integral part of our academic calendar stands as a testament to our unwavering commitment to honor those who have dedicated their lives to advancing the cause of equality, justice, and relentless pursuit of truth. To extend family and friends of Professor Fatima Mea. Your presence here today resonates deeply with the profound impact she had on the lives of those she touched. Your continued support, participation in this annual event inspires us as the community and the university to uphold her values and continue her noble work and work in promoting social harmony and understanding. Wow, mark that one, and understanding. That's something that is very rare in our space of life. I also take the opportunity to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Samim Mdluli, a notable artist, art historian, a writer, who will address us today in this particular lecture. Talking into the defiance and resilience that the theme of the lecture embraces, Mia's culture, creativity, social capital, artistic vision, and so forth. We thank you for joining us. To our cherished staff, the committee members of the, Mia, of the Fatima Mia Lecture, 
we have put together this event for our benefit. Your enthusiasm for engaging with the ideas and concepts that challenge conventional wisdom is what makes our institution thrive. As we delve into the intellectual disc discourse that this lecture promises, let us remember that we stand on the shoulders of giants. I like that we're talking about a woman. Professor Fatima Mia, who paved the way for us to engage in meaningful conversations that transcends disciplines and boundaries. Oh, wow, I salute her. Distinguished guests, scholars, activists, your presence enriches the discourse and amplifies the reason, oh, and amplifies and resonates, and resonates to the theme of this event. Your shared commitment to fostering an inclusive and equitable society mirrors the essence and the legacy we honor today. The annual Fatima Mia Lecture is not just an occasion or event. It is a statement and a testament to power of ideas. Oh, wow. And transformative potential of education. It embodies the spirit of fearlessness, of fearlessness inquiry, of fearless inquiry, lifelong learning, and pursuit of justice. Professor, Mat F Professor Fatima Mia exemplifies all these for us. As we embark on this intellectual journey, let us reflect on the words of Professor Fatima Mia herself. She said, I quote, regardless of how many years we have spent in this world, we must get up and shout. I want to repeat that. Regardless of how many years we have spent in this life, we must get up and shout. I kind of see that spirit in her face, and I picture her efforts in her words. Once again, I extend my warm welcome on behalf of our DVCN school, the college, and the university at large to all of you. May this lecture serve as a source of inspiration. Wow. Sparking conversations that challenge our perspectives and guiding us towards the future that upholds the ideas that Professor Fatima Mia held dearly. With those words of welcome, I want you to relax, listen, and take an eye to see. You might realize her world still lives amongst us and with us. In honor, I say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shapley, for those amazing words of welcome. It is a really special honor to welcome to the stage Ila Gandhi. Um, Ila Gandhi is not only the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi, but was also a member of parliament in the first South, Af first South African uh, democratic government, in Mandela's government. Ila was a close family friend, fellow activist with Fatima Mir, and um, we are honored to have her speak to us um, on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, 
for inviting me to this very special occasion. Um, Fatima, besides being a colleague, was a family friend. Um, she and my sister, my older sister, grew up together. And uh, I know they shared a lot of, uh, you know, activities together. My sister was also involved in the defiance campaign in 1952 when Fatima Mir was also involved in those campaigns. So um, I was still a little child then, but I remember and admired them, particularly Fatima Mir. So I speak from a family point of view, from a personal, you know, relationship with her. Um, you know, she was like an older sister to me. Uh, there were times when I would make mistakes and she would correct me. Um, and I accepted because she was that to me, an older sister. <clears throat> But growing up, I admired her courage. And you know, just as um, a lot of people talk about people like Lillian Ngoi, people, you know, Charlotte Mteke, and other famous women, Sarojini Naidu, in the Indian struggle, and uh, many other brave women. So when we think about Fatima Mir, you know, growing up, that's the role model that we had. We looked up to her as we did these other women from the past generation. She became a really, you know, a, a, a really good role model for many of the women or many of the girls of my age who wanted to participate in, uh, you know, in the uh, liberation struggle of that time. Even though there was a lot of, uh, you know, repression, but many of us, you know, and lots of women, I must say, during that time participated in the struggles. Um, and so, you know, we all had to look up to somebody, and that somebody was Fatima Mir. And I'll tell you why. What happened to us, what I saw with my own eyes, not read. But there was an occasion, and uh, somehow it's not stated in the books. So, you know, but I was there, and I know what happened on that day. On the 26th of June, I think it was in 1959, when there was a huge rally, or it could be 1958, I'm not quite sure, but there was a huge rally at the Curry's Fountain. They say nearly 15,000 people turned up. And this rally was organized by, uh, you know, the NIO, which is the Natal, um, Indian organization, which was uh, said to be, can you hear me? <laughs> I think power shortage or power uh, load shedding, but um, okay. So, um, you know, there were 15,000 people at the Curry's Fountain and the, the rally was organized by uh, multiple uh, organizations. There were ratepayers organizations. There was the uh, NIO, which was a more conservative organization of the Indian community, and then the NIC, and um, various other organizations. And what we saw is that the businesses in Durban closed early so that the workers could go to the rally. Schools closed so that the students could go to this rally. And that's how they had 15,000 people at the Curry's Fountain. Now, we were expecting some of the leaders from ANC and NIC to come and address that rally. It was against the Group Areas Act. Unfortunately, many of the leaders were banned and uh, listed, and they couldn't come. And then we suddenly hear this booming sound from the from Curry's Fountain. 
and we see a short, thin person there. We thought it might be a child, and it happened to be Fatima Mir, who made the speech on that day. And I tell you, there was electrifying silence when she was speaking. <clears throat> Her speech, I can't remember the whole speech, and I wish somebody will bring, you know, find that speech, the researchers, yeah, and find that uh, occasion, those other people who were present there and may remember more. But it was really, you know, something that just hit us, the powerful message that came from Fatima. That's when we said, this is our role model. Because, you know, um, there was no one else, and here was this woman who came out, despite the fact that the whole of Paris Fountain was surrounded by police, security police, and so on. But she had the courage and the bravery to go there and make that speech. And she didn't mince her words. I can testify to that. I'm not sure where those stories are, but uh, Ramesh is here. Other people who are doing research, please find that story. And uh, for, for posterity, it's very important. Um, I also want to say that, you know, if, if we are looking today in terms of art and of personality to promote uh, these things for today's climate, I think the important thing that she left for us was not just her humility and humble attitude, but she had a militant uh, personality as well, full of courage. Whatever she wanted to say, she would say it, and it would be clear. No mincing of words or anything. She would just say it. And I think today we need that, that kind of courage. Many of us, even though we don't have that kind of special branch, and that kind of uh, uh, you know, repression in today's climate, we still are afraid to speak out. And this is what the message from Fatima made. I also believe that uh, women's rights were uppermost in her mind. And you know that she paved the way when she challenged the system this university was out of bounds. I was also a, mem uh, a student at, of Natal University. That's what it was called at that time. But we had to attend classes in Sastry College because we were not allowed to come here to this place. But Fatima Mir not only came here, but she lectured to both the white students and to the non-white students on the other campuses. She was able to challenge the system and, and uh, you know, uh, put her footprints in the right place. And that's what she paved the way for all of us afterwards when we boycotted graduation, for instance, and protested against the discriminatory laws of this university and so on. But she paved the way. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, she also um, showed us that, you know, when, when I say that we had that uh, huge rally with all these different organizations, what it indicates is that when you are fighting a political battle, you don't always have full agreement. There are people who would disagree with you. And if they disagree with you, it's okay. You can sit and talk. But as long as your aim is the same aim, you can work with people of different, um, you know, um, uh, political viewpoints. We had, in those days, the Black Consciousness Movement. We had, uh, you know, many other organizations and uh, the Congress Movement. And she was able to relate to all of them, which shows that you can have an open mind and, uh, you know, 
a work with all those people. I think that is another point that we have to learn today, the young people, that we don't have to fight with each other, we don't have to eliminate people, we don't have to become violent, we can do it non-violently, which is what she did. She stuck to her non-violent principles. And, uh, you know, she was able to win a number of battles. Like I said, here on this campus, she won a battle, challenged the system, and was able to come here. There were many other battles that she won, and I think the other speakers will tell you more about it. So for me personally, she was a family friend, but she was a role model for, for all of us uh, in my family my sister included, and my brother and myself. We all admired her as that courageous woman in our circle. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Incredibly beautiful and, and heartfelt. Those reminiscences and that history is absolutely important. Um, I mean, in thinking about that history, it's, it's always a question of how that, those, those, those moments and those ideas are captured or stored for future generations. And part of the work that the Memorial Lecture Committee has taken on is to think about um, an archiving dimension to, to this committee. So, so before we get to the keynote, uh, I would just like to call Dr. Roshni Patha to the stage, who will speak to us about the initiatives that are underway with the Fatima Mir archives and special collections. Dr. Patha is the manager at Services and Special Collections at UKZN. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Roshni Patha, and I work at UKZN Library Services. So on behalf of the university and the library management team, it's my pleasure to be here today. So a library special collection holds much value. It's the conduit for preserving cultural heritage, a glimpse into the past, and most importantly, impacts research and the transfer of knowledge. At the University Library Services, and specifically our special collections, our core strategic goal is to promote accessibility and visibility of the material. We are prioritizing the digitization of rare, fragile, and collections such as this. And to ensure that the special collections remains available to present and future generations of library users, the library engages to conserve and preserve the material and make the collections more durable. We ensure the long-term physical preservation of the collections to support um, research, teaching, learning, and academic success for the university and uh, outside researchers. By digitizing the special collections and loading it onto an open access platform, it gives the special collections a place to exercise its intention, telling a story to those who interact with it. We have the library services, we have the responsibility to record faithfully the history and social, cultural, religious, political, educational and recreational life of the community and to make these resources accessible to the world. In this way, we guarantee the safekeeping of these items and the continuation of our cultural heritage. The library continues to fulfill its role as the heart of the university. It contributes directly to the institution's academic mission, and our resources play a key role in research, teaching, and learning. So it plays a major role in providing these resources and services, not only to the staff of the university and our students, but also to the community as well. So currently, we have approximately about 300 items of various books, journal articles, and manuscripts of Prof. Mir, which we'd like to develop, digitize, and preserve. And I'm so happy that Mrs. Gandhi brought up that story. 
um, because that is our exact intention, um, to, to, to collect all of that material and make it accessible to everybody. So Prof Mir, um, as she said, was an academic at the university from 1956 to 1988 at the then University of Natal. Uh, and she was a political activist. She had been invited to numerous academic and other conferences where she fearlessly spoke against the country's apartheid policies. She produced over 40 books, some as an author, some as the editor, and some as a publisher. Her lectures and conference papers made a major impact on international audiences and enhanced her international reputation as one of the country's most articulate black spokesperson. She has also been the recipient of numerous honors and awards conferred on her by governments and institutions both at home and abroad. Um, it's well known that her father was the editor and owner of Indian Views um, that was founded in 1912. So we have the Gandhi Latuli Documentation Center based at our Westville campus, and they have that print collection, um, that they have that print newspaper in its collection, and we are actually embarking on a project to digitize that. So I'm here this evening to appeal to you to donate any items that you may have of Prof. Um, Fatima Mir, whether it's you know, an artifact, a journal, an article, a recording, manuscript, artworks, whatever you have. And we, the library services, undertake to preserve and store these in our archive. Um, UKZN Library Services, we have an institutional repository and a data repository. And we have the necessary infrastructure to develop and store the collection. We also have the expertise and knowledge to do that. So we welcome you to entrust us with the collection and we will ensure its long-term preservation and accessibility. Donors are welcome to email um, fmirarchives at ukzn.ac.za. And as a librarian, I can share that it's very important to document this valuable collection and make it available for many generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patha. That's indeed a, a really amazing initiative. So if there is any, and I guess the advert will go out in the appropriate spaces. Um, but right now, I'd like to get on with the business end of this evening, which is to call the keynote speaker and the two respondents, as well as the, um, the chair um, to the stage. So doctor, four doctors, Dr. Jainathan Govinda, Dr. Prashani Naidu, Dr. Nanda Subban and Dr. Sami Mdluli, if you could please come to the stage. Um, the format of the evening is Dr. Mdluli will give her keynote, uh, followed by the two respondents, um, and then we'll open for a question and answer session afterwards. I'm going to start by introducing our illustrious panel. Um, so starting with um, Dr. Jayanathan Govinda, who is faculty member at the School of Social Sciences at UKZN. His research is focused on civil society, public policy, inequality studies, clinical sociology, BRICS sociology, and COVID-19. He's a uh, prestigious affiliations include visiting fellow at the Jawaharlal Nehru University of Advanced Studies, New Delhi, uh, the Shivaji University, Kolhapur, University of Mumbai, visiting professor and faculty advisor at Chandigarh University, Punjab. His recent edited publication is a handbook on the sociology of inequalities in BRICS countries. Welcome. Our first respondent is Dr. Nanda Subban. Durban-based anti-apartheid and award-winning cartoonist, activist, journalist, and animator. He was the only black published cartoonist during apartheid, and he founded the Center for Fine Art Animation and Design. His widely published syndicated cartoons have won him global acclaim. Dr. Subin's credentials include the Parsons School of Design USA, the Art Institute Paris, um, 
Cater Manor People Were Living There in the 1980s was a defiance exhibition, um, My Life as a Black Political Cartoonist in Apartheid South, South Africa, which was lauded at the USA World Affairs Council. His murals for the Eco 92 Earth Summit in New York, Peace Mural, were accompanied with the Heritage, the Silver Tusk, US Congressional, and an Amnesty Award. Dr. Subin work, works Dr. Subin's works can be explored at the Kennedy Library in Boston, the Mandela Collection, and at the Killy, Kimball, Killy Campbell Library uh, in Durban. Welcome, Dr. Subin. Prishani Naidu is the second respondent um, and is the director of Society, Work, and Politics at Wits University, a very important research institute, and a member of the sociology party, uh, sociology department, not party, <laughs> maybe it's better off as a party, um, at Wits since 2008. She has a BA Honours in Comparative Literature from Wits and a PhD in Development Studies from the UKZN. Prishani has a long history of activism, beginning in the South African student movement of the 1990s and including the formations that emerged in the 2000s to, the re to resist the adoption of neoliberal policies in South Africa. Her research interests have been shaped from the intersections of these experiences, looking to alternatives for forms of life that exist outside of the imaginaries of waged work and representative politics. And finally, Dr. Ngludli. Dr. Mglouli is a, is a Johannesburg-based, award-winning artist, historian, and curator, as well as a writer. She has a PhD in the history of art from WITS, and has worked at the Goodman Gallery, held exhibitions, presented conferences globally and locally, and has served, and served her residency as a junior research scholar at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. She served as a guest researcher at the Institut National de Histoire de l'Art in Paris, for the Cultural Profession Program under Art and Globalization. Her research on contemporary African art, black expressive modes and aesthetics, and conversations between jazz and visual art is groundbreaking. Prior to her current role as, the stand, as a curator of the Standard Bank Gallery, she served as a sessional academic at the University of Witwatersrand. And with that, Dr. Samuel Nkluli, please take the stage. But it's fine, I'll, because the image is already there. Yeah. Did you have a particular one? No, it's fine. I think it will make the connections. Cool. Okay. I'm a little bit short. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. And I'm really privileged and honored to be here um, and presenting this paper which is a very kind of condensed and shortened version of the work that I did as part of my, my master's um, when I discovered Fatima Mir's um, paintings, particularly the ones that she did um, while she was held um, it, at the women's jail in Constitution Hill. So while I was there, I was also studying as, as an MA student, and I was working in the archives of Conhill, which is you know, obviously it was a prison before that it was known as the fort um, and consists now of Constitution Hill, which is where our constitutional court is, um, as well as what is now the museum site, which is the precincts that were the prison. And these paintings for me became um, an important discovery because at the site there's only five that are displayed. And the five that I displayed seem to be uh, kind of enhancing and in a way speaking to the site as promoting it as a political site as opposed to a place where ordinary people were held, not just political prisoners. And so the paintings for me became important because they revealed that other narrative and that other um, part of the, the prison's kind of workings and that it was not only political prisoners that were held at that site. So my address this evening takes a, an art historical perspective in unpacking Mia's cultural creativity as a means of understanding how Fatima Mia's work is now relevant and can be relevant to today's context. My address this evening is also a tribute to her, as I've said, because 
um, the discovery of that work, I think, shifted the way in which I then you know, approached my, my MA as well. And to this day, how I approach my creative output um, in the work that I do as well. There's little known um, as to why Mia created these images that are displayed at the women's jail. And she gives little detail as to why she even did them in the prison diary as well, which is one of the publications she wrote and contributed towards as an activist and socialist. Perhaps the very act of creating these, like Ahmed Katrada, notebooks of quotations, was an act of defiance, as this was not permitted. There may have been a mere record of her time in jail, but the readings of these paintings suggest her political views may have also conditioned the way she chose to represent her experience of being in jail by portraying the cruelty of the apartheid regime and the humiliation of women incarcerated as criminals at the women's jail. It may have also been a political act which goes beyond the definitions of prison art. And according to an article about art made in this context, often it gives this title to demonstrate an aesthetic distinct that, is usually, that usually says little about the actual work. But it can also reflect meaningful conditions under which art is made and has an enormous effect on the characteristic or the character of the artist's work. Prison reality includes boredom, severely restricted tools, lack of materials, which also allows for only certain kinds of work to be created. This type of art has qualities that give such labels meaning, but it also demonstrates that style and technique are not simply choices made by these artists, but are usually a culmination of no loneliness, frustration, and the struggle to express oneself. But in Mia's case, her, obsess her obsessive emphasis on the details not only shows her consciousness of being in prison or being in prison in imprisonment, but also the desire to include everything within the picture because she was documenting rather than expressing her feelings, um, although these are not necessarily exclusive. Painting could have been a means of tra to transcend the confines of prison because creativity defies the attempt of prison to make prisoners conform and act in predictable ways. In other words, prisoners can resist attempts to imprison their minds. So Mia was clearly influenced by these ideas of non-racialism, um, and this reflects in some of her paintings where she captures women in groups as opposed to individuals places emphasis, and places emphasis on their activities rather than their circumstances. She rejects separation based on race and considers this principle in the way she presents all the women as equal, with no distinction between race or status. But she also came from a tradition of political activism and increasingly became involved in other activities directed at mending the estranged relationship between Indian and African communities. When Mia starts to document her experience of being incarcerated in the women's jail, she was not only responding to a creative impulse of reacting to confinement, but also liberation of being, the liberation of being able to express oneself in such a context. Her use of imagery, in addition to text highlights, her awareness of how imagery, political, particularly politically charged imagery, became an influential and essential part of the liberation movement. Historically, in the use of culture as a tool for mass mobilization, as, as this, the tool for mass mobilization grew out of art, this came from during the Russian revolution called the Atiprop, which Mir and others could well have been aware of. So Mir was aware of the power of imagery, but it can also be used, and that it can also be used as propaganda. She was influenced by a growing sense of how culture could be deployed in the struggle, especially since she had such a well-developed political consciousness by the mid-70s from when her paintings in prison were created. The cultural activity of the early 1980s were therefore a culmination of artists who were actively consciously, and make, making, consciously making work directed against apartheid, which stemmed from the ideologies of the 1970s 
And so Mia's interest in art, besides the fact that it was a hobby, may have been informed by the ideological climate of the 1970s when the liberation movement turned to cultural resistance. So the women's jail was this interesting space as well that was not only multiracial um, in terms of how the women interacted with each other, even though they lived separate, there was still um, segregation according to race within the jail. But there was this sense of multiculturalism, um, however, was not really reflected in the contents of how the museum is now reframed in the contemporary context. Instead, the asserted political narrative that features prominent figures like Mia and Madigizela Mandela, for example, who are presented as powerful, charismatic leaders, tends to overpower the potential for this section or the site to give a more diverse and multifaceted historical account of the site. There are many possible motives for why Mia may have created these images, but even she doesn't give this indication um, in detail as to whether this was what was kind of prompting her, this kind of multiculturalism that was happening within the prison. Um, and amongst the women. And perhaps they is, that's also because I think the images were also illegal, so she was doing them in secret um, as well. Um, so certain things, for example, she wasn't allowed to depict in her, in her, in her images. There are 20 Im images that are now uh, part of the Constitution Hill um, Archives collection. And they're done in a range of materials that include pencil, ballpoint, poster paint, and watercolor paint. They're all titled, and some have captions describing the picture. So this one title, there are two actually titled Detainees Sal 1 and 2. They're very similar in the way they look. The one is done in ball pen, and the other a little bit more detailed in poster paint. As I said, that depicts the same scene or routine on different days. Part of the caption of Detainees describes the scene in the Detainees, the other uh, uh, drawing. And it depicts women sitting, idling in front of their cell. And it's dated September 1976. It shows a group of women, Janine Noel, Sibongi Kubeka, Sally Modlana, Cecile Palmer, and Joyce Soroka, as well as Vesta Smith and Beauty during their free time and in the afternoon. They're all engaged in various activities and all except Beauty are interacting with each other. They are all, except for one, facing away from the viewer, and there's, an, there's no specific focal point, although the, way, the wall dividing the narrative interrupts the picture. They are dressed in different colors, different color clothing, most likely their own clothing, and they are seated on the veranda during their free time. One of them is reading a book, and it is one of the few works done in pen and thin washes of watercolor paint. Unlike Detainees 2, it shows the improvisation of material where when she, was, she started making drawings, as Mia explains in a caption of one of her first and few works done in pen, she was only allowed a ballpoint pen at the time. Later, she was allowed more ballpoints in different colors. And so you can see that kind of changing also in, her, in the drawings and the paintings as well. Um, thereafter, the poster paints come in and were allowed under strict instruction to paint only flowers. Again, I think, um, you know, the association of you know, her being a woman and the expectation is that, of course, she'll paint these lovely flower, you know, <laughs> things. But she doesn't then do that. What does she do? She, she paints the prison. <laughs> um, in some places, the image appears rushed and seems as if she was running out of material or that she was, again, the sense of doing things in urgency because you're quickly doing it and you're not, you're not allowed to be, um, to be doing it. Um, in some, and in other places, it gives the image some sort of credibility as well. It, it's also not clear where Mia places herself in, the, in these images or in any of the, of the images that supports the assumption that she, she created these images in secret and perhaps while in her cell alone, considering that she was only allowed to paint certain subjects or subject matter. 
Most of the paintings have a voyeuristic quality, almost as if Mia was painting as an observer rather than a detainee herself. But perhaps this is because she saw herself as a socialist and a political activist and felt the need to document and present what was happening in the prison under apartheid. However, she does, she does also give herself a strong presence in the picture, which is indicated by the captioning and accompanying the image where she uses words like our and we, as well as the direct um, frontal views of of the, of the pictures themselves that look as if she has pos she's positioned in front of the scene while painting. It also appears, appears as though this, her ver this version of the set of, of paintings that she did was a lot less rushed with certain level of control and painting um, medium. And this is where I think more of the painterly works become a little bit more expressive. So besides merely creating a record, Mia also appears to have had a basic understanding of elements of art, where she shows perspective and gives the picture a sense of depth in the, her treatment of things like doors, of the cell, the way in which the, women's are, the women are seated, for example. Both images, both images also have an enormous amount of detail that tell one that Mia not only wanted to show the mundane routine of being in prison, but as suggested in her diary entry during this month, her, the very act of painting, itself, you know, painting the paintings themselves, emphasized how informed and defined these group of women were. On the entry of Friday the 10th, sep September 1976, she describes the routine of the day and writes, and I quote, we are allowed to be together from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Most of our time is used cleaning, washing, bathing, and sitting on the stoop talking. This has made a great difference in our lives. We laugh away our imprisonment, sing it away, dance it away. We read, discuss, and write down our thoughts as I do now. A very famous Solange song now. <laughs> so in a sense, she was also painting away her time in prison, suggesting that the very act of creation is an act of resistance. Each of the women in the painting has been given distinct characteristics that set them apart as individuals, rather than being viewed as prisoners or even criminals that some of the charges they were detained for suggest. They are also not dressed in convicted prisoners' uniforms, dressing their distinction as women who are not only psychologically imprisoned, who are not only psychologically imprisoned. Although they appear, this pair could be represented or presented together um, besides, in addition to the five images that are displayed in the, in the site um, at Con Hill, at the women's jail, it seems, I think, that some of these artworks were also, well, were chosen by the curators to substantiate as proof of the site in its current state. And the possible reason for selecting images for reproduction as banners, you know, as discussed, was... Um, again, to authenticate the stories of the women as well as uh, Mia's documentation of the site. Um, that, for example, there are certain walls, brick walls, that you will see in the other paintings that have been um, rotating that still exist today that are part of the site um, that, again, I think substantiate the, the paintings um, and their validity and, um, and relevance to today. Um, sorry. In the card players, Mia shows a group of women, of, of five women playing cards. And if she had not indicated the water in the caption, the viewer would not be able to tell the difference between her and the other four women who were the prisoners. It was also one of the few paintings that is dated, and it's dated the 3rd of October 1976 and could therefore be referenced to be a diary entry as a way of determining how moments such as these slipped past the watchful eye of prison authorities. On this day, though, Mia does not mention making an artwork, but rather talks about her obstacle of trying to get a bucket from one of the wardresses to do her laundry, and her concern over a group of teenagers that had supposedly uh, been moved to another yard. 
but she also reveals that the matron who usually inspects them in the morning was away that day. So one of the younger ward wardresses took over the ritual herself and it made things easier. It was also a Sunday and Mia sounds nostalgic, missing her husband Ismail after not seeing him for more than a week. The image is one of the few which show women close up and where Mia focuses on the forms and activities that exclude evidence of the jail. There's no trace of the face brick wall background, which is a distinct visual characteristic that runs through almost all the work, but rather a strange ultramarine blue background that's darkened around the wardress. The different colors of their clothing and the different types of headgear they are wearing are all carefully treated to emphasize how each woman represented should be viewed as an individual rather than a prisoner. And this is, a clear, this is clear also in their facial features and expressions as well as their gestures where Mia has drawn the wardress, for instance, with her head bowed as if she's hiding or does not want to be recognized um, and accentuates the one, the, the one woman's cheekbones. It is very colorful, it's a colorful work and feels celebratory in the sense that such a small activity probably brought them a lot of joy in a place of time or a time of despair, so playing cards. It is a memory that moments where they, are, where they did not feel like they were prisoners, but as women regardless of the kind of authority they had over one another. And then there are two other paintings that uh, Mia did of her cell, uh, very similar. And the two are probably the most intimate and personal of the paintings depicting Mia's um, uh, uh, experience in jail. They are the only ones that show the inside of the prison cells, showing some of the utilities or utensils that the uh, prisoners were allowed to use, like a sanitary bucket and a few personal items. In My Cell One, which is the title she gives it, Mia des depicts the bolted door of the cell as the focal point of the image, which places emphasis on the room as a small, uncomfortable space. There's what looks like a towel cap hanging on the right-hand side of the door, and the few items like a newspaper and sanitary bucket on the floor. It is not clear where, when Mia created this image because it's, it is not dated. But she gives description of the cell in her diary, which has made, made it more vivid when you see these two images. They are a lot more contemplative, and perhaps this is because she had more privacy to complete them. In my painting one, there's even a, it's a slightly larger image than the rest of the paintings, which accentuates the emphasis on the walls. In my cell too, the bed has a strange perspective that makes it look like a room is kind of, the room is kind of closing in on her. It looks quite similar to a Van Gogh painting of the room. He liked painting rooms as well. Um, Les Chambres de, de Arles, which is a, a, room, a room he stayed in in a hotel. And for me, when I saw this, this painting in Mia's uh, um, painting of the cell, the similarities were striking, not only in how she used the visual language of um, depicting you know, a claustrophobic space, but that she was also aware of kind of the stylistic characteristics you can use to manipulate color, form, depth, perspective, etc. And perhaps Mia was emphasizing a sense of pride and dignity um, that she maintained throughout her detention as well. Political pris prisoners differentiated themselves because they believed they were imprisoned for a different reason or a different cause. They were also given other privilege or different privileges from, other, from the rest of the other prisoners. Being allowed reading materials, for example, and as shown in Mia's case um, and her paintings, this also included newspapers that informed them of current events happening outside the jail. It seems then that Mia was aware of stylistic techniques that were not arbitrary, but aimed at achieving a specific feeling or outcome. But with the exception of the two cell paintings, which may have been painted inside the cell, these paintings were largely based on memory and therefore posed questions around the level of interpretation in the work. 
A painting is more sub susceptible to manipulation than, say, a photograph, for example. And so it's possible that there are things in the images that may be exaggerated or d even distorted to give a certain emotion or arouse or evoke a certain emotion because you knew the power of imagery. An analogy is made with the work of Ernest Cole, whose photographs uh, reflected the texture of the everyday, depicting ordinary people's struggle during the apartheid. And it serves to demonstrate how these paintings differed from his documentary oppose, approach. Like Mia's images, Cole's photographs were taken discreetly, showing the humiliating ordeals of many people of color that they had to encounter during the apartheid, especially in urban areas and mine compounds where their movement was restricted and their bodies strictly monitored. Cole's photographs emphasize the violation of humiliation of physical control and then on the streets, often the bleakness of apartheid. Mia's pictures, however, do not have the same intensity, nor physical violation or even extreme bleakness is shown. There is a sense that she wanted to maintain a sense of dignity and humility in the figures she represented. And this quality enhances the visitor's experience at the museum in particular ways. Visitors are able to identify the subjects in the images, and not only as viewers, but also as per at a personal level that allows them to imagine what it is like to be in prison. They show the tenacious efforts of women to remain human in spite of the inhumane conditions they lived in, and allow for a deeper kind of reflection, allowing although the ones that are, in, are enlarged into the big banners tend to distort the level of intimacy conveyed by each of these paintings. Mia's paintings be, remain significant because they suggest a broader understanding of the history of the women's jail, but it also, they also highlight the issues of exclusivity about who gets commemorated versus who doesn't and in which manner. So the stories of black women's lives in South Africa illustrate that while social capital can be attributed to one's social standing, it can also be determined by other factors often influenced by one's upbringing. The social standing of women of color in society has thus only not only been determined by their race and class, but also more conventionally by the social structure of the family as determined by patriarchy and st stereotypical notions of relegating women to domestic settings. In South Africa, we know that this was not only disrupted and impacted by migration and the search for economic opportunities, but also the socioeconomic implications of that reality. And so for, black women to, for a black woman to be educated, let alone active in politics and social studies, made figures like Fatima Mir an exception at the time. In Women and Resistance in Art, Cheryl Walker notes how, and I quote, women are distributed throughout the class spectrum, and it is this, the different class positions, rather than their shared sex, that finally determines their basic and varied political allegiances, end quote. Mia's social work began at an early age where in 1944, in her second year of high school, she became involved in her first fundraising initiative. That same year, she wrote her junior certificate examination, the first being, um, which was her second public examination, and the first being the standard six exam. As a high school student, Mia excelled in literature and history, encouraged and inspired by her teacher, Mrs. Hammond an unmarried woman whose old mother was once a skillful painter. A recount of a visit to Mrs. Hammett's house by Mia describes how their house was adorned with many of her paintings along with her imparting a sense of high morale and deep interest in South African history. As a woman of color, Mia was, of course, one of the exceptions given her family social standing and influence in the political struggle. Her father, Mia, did not only um, come from a well-educated background, but was also the editor and um, publisher of the Indian View, which had a strong anti-colonial stance, and many of the men in Fatima's extended family played leading roles in the South African Indian Congress in Natal. 
And so Mia often helped it with, helped with um, distribution and work uh, of the newspaper, and therefore became politically conscious and socially active. Working in the newspaper context also meant that she was exposed to imagery, and that was firstly supposed, or, or imagery that was firstly supposedly illegal, and secondly, perhaps more importantly, images that are viewed as emotional and evocative for a specific readership. She is presented as one of the political heroines of the women's jail, not because she was brave enough to create these images while she was in detention, but primarily because she played a critical role in the liberation movement. Her testimony, however, is represented only through five of the selected visual um, forms in the banners, rather than her political work that ultimately led to her detention at the women's jail like Barbara Hogan, who also came from an educated and academic background, notes, Mia was one of the few women whose recollection of the prison comes across as articulate and meticulous, perhaps because they could keep records of their experiences. In her prison diary, Mia tells of how she was treated differently from other prisoners and allowed certain privileges, firstly because she was not classified as black but Asian, and secondly, because she was a high-profile figure detained on serious charges. So even in prison, she had a status different from that of other prisoners based on racial classifications in the prison system. And her place in socio-political so, socio arena in the outside world. This allowed her access to paint and paper, which the prison warders believed she used to paint birthday cards and Christmas cards for other prisoners. To draw or document any part of the prison was not permitted, and yet Mia was able to create a total of 20 images um, that were essentially politically motivated. Some, smuggled out of, some, some of these um, paintings were eventually smuggled out of the prison through her lawyer, through Winnie Madagizela Mandela's lawyer, and the rest were sm smuggled out through one of the black waters. So again, they have this interesting, I think, story of how they leave the site and eventually come back again um, to, I guess, authenticate the story or the narrative of, of, the, of the site. <laughs> Mia's paintings do not, bring, do not only bring uh, politicized sites like the women's jail into sharp focus by challenging their focus on the strongly masculinist and narrowly political narrative, but they also point to this dis disparities between social and the political stratas that relates to class, race, and gender. In the narrative, um, masculinist and nar narrowly political narrative, women are usually portrayed as the nurturers and supporters, the mothers of the nation. They're very rarely shown as powerful political opponents, with the exception, of course, of the 1956 Women's March or as having gone through experiences that are different from those of men, or as narrators of their own stories speaking directly to the, to the public. Her paintings thus seem to offer something different and qualitatively different in knowledge and acknowledging the role of art and culture as part of resistance against apartheid. And so they also encourage us to look at this um, area of how art can be a tool, or art was eventually used as a tool for resistance. I think organizations like the Medu Sambo did that, but from a, a, a more South African scholarly point of view in art, I think that there's a paucity or a lack of scholarly literature pertaining to this subject, and it is testament to how I think the narrow focus on the political narrative tends to distract or detract from the overall picture of how people resisted the conditions imposed upon them in their ordinary ways. And yet Mia was, I think, part of a, a, a member of an elite family, having been highly educated and coming from an affluent family, along with other prominent figures commemorated, commemorated at the women's jail. But what her paintings then do, and this is where I also end off, is that they mediate the unheard voices. They suggest that 
or articulate or the less articulated and the poorer or the less privileged and the marginalized women. They are allow, they allow for that, for those narratives to come through. Um, who are also part of their site, of, of that site. Um, and so it is important that in tracing the, the history of the, of, the, of the museum itself, that this view or this narrative is given a much, or gives a much fuller and richer experience for viewers to experience the site in its fullness as opposed to solely the political or solely um, a masculine narrative that we are now um, challenging. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mzluli. Um, I mean, before I hand over to the first respondent, it's just to really to underscore how important that research is. Um, one, in the context of Fatima Mir's um, practice, it's, it's, it's a largely overlooked or underlooked, uh, if at all looked at, area of a practice, and making those links is absolutely important. I think, and there's, there's importantly a larger art historical or historical project of rethinking what we understand as our received history and, and finding the gaps in it, and, and that's absolutely important. So thank you. Same, Same also was instrumental through her research and herself in having the work, the paintings themselves, which you can see on this banner here, um, restored um, so that they, they, they were cleaned up and conserved in the appropriate manner at the Constitution Hill Women's Prison, which is absolutely important. Um, now, Dr. Nanda uh, Subin, could you please come to the stage? Or well, you're already on the stage. Uh, I'm not, not sure if I'm going to respond to all, all that you said. I'll take it as, it, as you said it. Um, I just want to speak about Fatima Mir. Uh, that's what I prepared. Uh, I didn't prepare, I just, that's what I was thinking about. Uh, in a world of stupid men, before apartheid, during apartheid and after apartheid, Fatima Mir was a dynamite of wisdom and good sense wrapped in a sari. Uh, I, I just want to say something more personal. Um, uh, it was the 10th anniversary of our democracy, and she asked me to do a book of my cartoons. With Ramesh, we sat down and we chose the cartoons. Um, she wrote the forward to my book, <clears throat> and then, a few weeks before the launch of the books, of my uh, books, she fell ill. And then Ramesh had organized Pitika and Tuli and Ashwin Desai to be the speakers. While they were speaking, they started having a fight because they were reading my cartoons and, and discussing the way the country was going. And they each had a different viewpoint of how the country was going. And then, while that was happening, Fatima Mir was wheeled into the, the gallery where the book launch was taking place with a nurse with her. And she said she had to, she was supposed to be the keynote speaker and she was very ill. And then she was wheeled in and she said, she came in and she did a speech and she said she had to be here to speak at the book launch. And it goes to show the type of woman that she was, the kind of person that she was, and she died a few weeks later, and that was Fatima Mir. Uh, I'd, I'd, I speak better when I take questions, so I'll sit out and, and listen to everyone's questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subin. Um, Dr. Naidu Prashanti. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you, big thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me. Um, I must start by saying I'm extremely honored and humbled to have been invited to play this role today for many, many reasons, but mostly because Fatima Mir 
had and continues to have an important presence in my life. Um, from the kind of presence that many of us have experienced through her writings and her contributions to struggle, but also for me more personally, uh, or through a more personal relationship in particular with my father, Delina Naidu, who many of you know, um, who shared and built a relationship with her from the days of the revival of the Natal Indian Congress right through to the 1990s. Um, where we work, where, where they work together in several informal settlements um, around, in and around Durban. Um, and that 1990s moment was also an important uh, time for me um, as I, I think I was in matric in 1990 uh, and you know the start of the establishment or re-establishment of ANC branches and so on and I can see other comrades and friends here who share similar relationships with the Mir family. Um, through both um, IC and Fatima. Um, but my father, who's now in Johannesburg, <laughs> reminded me when I was coming of a few things. And I want to share one little anecdote uh, from that period of the 1990s, uh, where my dad went to fetch uh, Fatima from her Burnwood Road home uh, to go to a meeting that they had prepared for and she was supposed to lead. Um, and he got there and he says, she was still in her nightgown and wasn't ready to go. And she would not, uh, or she said that she would not be going. And uh, as he tells the story, she said, Dilly, my grandchildren are here. Um, and there's no way that I'm going to go to a meeting um, because there's no one in the world who will come and hug you and kiss you when you have a smelly mouth and you haven't combed your hair. And she didn't go to the meeting. And I'm sharing this story with you because I think it's an illustration of some of what Zame has been speaking to, uh, and more broadly in the paper that, that you circulated, um, about how um, politics, or the, the, the narration of politics, and the political narrative that becomes dominant often excludes the intimate, um, the experiences that happen in intimate spaces. Um, and those uh, stories of courage um, that you spoke about earlier um, that play themselves out in those intimate spaces are then lost uh, to history. And I think, uh, Sami, there, there's a distinction that I'd like to, to make that I think that you do, you do gesture towards. Um, a, a difference between what the museum does or the exhibition does and what the paintings actually do. Um, and so I want to locate my response uh, today in this space of the intimate. Um, and just to say, I live very close by to Constitution Hill, where the paintings are, and I'm really sorry you haven't been able to see them in, in their detail today. But I took a walk yesterday afternoon up um, to go and look at the paintings again. I'd seen them before. But in the past, it had always been with lots of other people um, and not having the time to actually take them in. Yesterday, I was completely on my own. When I entered, there were two other women uh, at the entrance. But other than the security guards and others milling around outside, I was the only person in the space where the paintings are exhibited. Um, and uh, as I walked around, I got really annoyed by the uh, audio uh, that was looping. So there's a single narrative audio or story being told over and over and over again. And although they have different women's voices, including some of the women who were in the jail, it submits um, the paintings and the kind of affect uh, and sensibility of the paintings um, to that single narrative of victory, of liberation. Um, and I got so annoyed that I actually just took pictures on my phone of the paintings and walked out. And I sat in the courtyard and I walked around <laughs> looking at the paintings again. And I'm sharing this because it, 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 it shifted how I related to those paintings. Um, and I, the question for me then became not what was she trying to say, uh, but how did she feel? How did they feel? And I think that's what the paintings 
uh, importance uh, is for me anyway. And I think in you know, response to your provocation at the start, Zen, you know, thinking about them in the present, um, I think that's something that we need to uh, hone in on and focus on a little more. So for me, it's, it's, yes, it's a documentation, but I think more than a record of what was happening and more than trying to create an authenticity, the paintings themselves, I mean, the museum might be doing something else, the exhibition might be doing something else, but the paintings themselves are both record of and a, a, a sense of feeling about struggle, about grappling with that particular moment. Um, and there's a sense for me of both acceptance and refusal. So there's an acceptance of, you know, this is our place of capture, but it's also a place from which we make life differently. Um, it might not always be the kind of life we imagine for ourselves, but there are moments in which we reclaim ourselves and we reclaim ourselves uh, in community with others, but also, as you mentioned, through a kind of self-reflection reflexiveness in that act of painting or in that mode of painting. Um, so, yeah, sorry, like Miriam asked me earlier, I can't always read my own writing. But, um, yeah, and I think here is where also the relationship between text and the visual becomes important. And I think she's doing something interestingly different in these small bits of text from the diary or, you know, the longer form writing. So, you know, just to give an example, you spoke about uh, those paintings. I think there are two of them. Uh, but the one that she speaks about as breaking the rules. So the, the black warden playing cards with, uh, with the prisoners and um, uh, her, her, her saying we're breaking the rules, but at the same time, she makes mention of the prison walls. Um, and she says, um, you know, if we had to escape, these are the walls we would have to scale. But she comes back and immediately says, but there are no skipping ropes here. You know, so there's, there's something different that she's doing, I think, you know, in, in the painting, but also her speaking to and about the painting and the experience um, itself. Um, and I think this, is, this brings me then to what I think sits at the center of those paintings. And, you know, in spite of, of uh, the, the grappling with, this, with the difficulty of being there, um, it's also a, 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 it's not just a, it, it's a, acting against the kind of dehumanizing um, uh, impositions um, of the prison itself. Uh, so there's a reclamation for me of being human, humanity in that space. Even, you know, the gestures towards or the, or the keeping in most of the paintings that sanitary bucket it's a sanitary bucket that shows that, you know, this is them not seeing us as human. But at the same time, we're acknowledging that and we're making something else around that. Um, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read again. Uh, I'll, I'll finish now, Zen. Uh, the quote that you um, read about, uh, because I think it speaks about uh, being together. And she says... We are allowed to be together from half past nine to half past 11. Most of our time uh, we spend cleaning, washing, bathing, uh, sitting on the stoop talking. We laugh away our imprisonment, uh, sing it away, dance it away, read, discuss, and write down as I do now. Um, and you then uh, speak about her painting away uh, the time in prison. And I think that's something really important to reflect on more. Because I think while it is, as you describe it, a creation as a form of resistance, um, it's also, I mean, prison also gives her the time to paint, right? Which she doesn't ordinarily have. Um, and just last week I was at Fort Hare, um, the archives there, um, saw the guitar made for uh, Govan and Becky by prisoners on Robben Island and learned for the first time, he learned to play the guitar on Robben Island. Didn't have the time otherwise to do that. 
Um, so, you know, in the, that space of capture, uh, I think uh, many moments of ambivalence. Um, and um, finally then, um, I think, you know, your, your uh, uh, mention and, and discussion of the question of dignity, I think is something that uh, needs to be thought more carefully in, in such spaces. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, all of this returns us to time, okay? So me being there yesterday from here took me to a time that I wasn't in ever, that I wasn't part of um, ever, and made me return or turn to that past in the present in ways that no written text would ordinarily do. Um, so I want to just leave also with a short story, because as I left the space yesterday, one of the two women who were there when I entered stopped me. And she asked me what I was doing, and I explained. And she said, I know, I know her. And then she said, I knew her. Um, and I said, oh. And she said, you know, you, you must have seen when you came in, there was a 12-year-old girl who was imprisoned at the same time. She said, that's me. <laughs> and we had a short conversation. I mean, I had to stop myself from going into, like, question mode. Um, but one of the, you know, I mean, she, she also just offered, um, yeah, I knew her, she was Winnie's big friend. And then she said, and she used to, and I said, crochet. And she said, yes. <laughs> So I mean, the, the little moments like that, but I think it speaks to your very last point uh, that you make, which I think has to seriously be confronted, and that is uh, the very real questions that we sit with today in terms of whose voice is not there, who has not been able to paint their story. But at the same time, you know, just last last little bit, as I sat in that yard, there's a painting that you also mentioned where Fatima is looking out on the outside world, but the, the wall takes up most of the painting, and then there's the Hillbrow Tower that she calls the Herzog Tower. Now, I sit with the Herzog Tower all the time. I live right across from there, but it's no longer the Herzog Tower, right? It's got, it was Coca-Cola, Vodacom, I don't remember what it is now. But I think also in memory, in time, in remembering, in taking stock of the record of history or the records of history, we need to acknowledge where we come from in this moment. And I think, um, you know, Fatima was not loyal constantly to a singular uh, path of struggle or liberation or history. In the 90s, she was also very critical of the movement she came from. And I think it's in that spirit uh, that we should be, uh, or could be, or might be relating to those paintings differently. Thank you. Thank you, Prashani. Um, that was an incredibly thoughtful and considered um, way to navigate many of the ideas that, that Sami started with. Um, Dr. Governor, can I hand over to you? Would you like to sit or come to the podium? Yeah, no, it's fine. Okay. I'll use this. Um, most uh, immensely fascinating, um, absolutely. Um, my task for the next 10 minutes uh, is to prompt you for uh, questions, and I think reasonably three questions, if that's okay. Uh, I've been warned about time. So I'm going to open the floor to the distinguished panel. Um, we'll take all three questions, um, and then we'll, well, please, please, you know, ask, uh, you know, the mem a member of the panel that you wish to direct a question, and uh, we'll ask them to give you a, a response. Um, so there's mics going around. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Timbi Sotetwayo. Uh, I just want to ask one question. Uh, as this was a lecture about 
uh, the activist, unfortunately, the first time I hear about her, but uh, we will research more about her. Uh, I just want to ask our honorable panel there on uh, how do they feel? Uh, in case you do not know, today is 16 August 2023. Uh, it was on this day when uh, Cyril Ramaphosa killed 34 mine workers in Marikana. Uh, before he repeated it uh, later on. So how do you feel about the fact that here in UK uh, there the is a command or an email from, in, for, from the management which says that uh, venues must not be used, no programs, okay. nothing. For, for, I, I'm just, just, just one question. No, we that one was just a... If, if you can allow me, you, you no, we realize... understand the question very, very well. All, all right, so just, thank you very much. Just, just five seconds. Just five seconds. Just five seconds, I promise you. So I, I, I just want to, to ask, how, how do you feel about that reality that young black people in this campus can no longer organize themselves, can no longer organize programs, psychosocial programs, all these important programs? Only those, only those uh, within the system can do so. We must only be subject, we must only RS RSVP for managed programs. We, we really thank so you how do you me. feel about that, that we, we are oppressed in this institution as young black people and as activists? We can no longer, today we are supposed to conduct two programs, Phoenix okay. Massacre, uh, Phoenix Massacre I'm Commemoration, Marikana Massacre Commemoration. We cannot as students, but there are programs, but on the email we are misled to say venues are not I'm open. Really to so how do you feel about that as activists and scholars? Okay, thank, thank you very much. We will try our best to answer the question from a Fatima Mir perspective. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, two, two more questions, please. Somebody at the back. Thank you. Do I have to stand? Okay. Wow. Thank you. My name is Tando Khadebe. I'm not an artist by any measure. I'm an accountant, but this has been such an eye-opening memorial. Thank you to Miriam for inviting us. Um, I think I have a comment and maybe a question. This was triggered during the keynote address, but also underscored by Dr. Naidu. So I'm thinking, so this lady, uh, Dr. Fatima, Professor Fatima Mir, she captures the moments, you know, she captures the memories of being um, in, incarcerated. She doesn't date them, some, most of them, she doesn't date them. And I'm trying to put myself in her shoes. I'm thinking, and of, of course, also the, the time span between these, uh, you know, paintings or drawings, it's like so close to each other. So I'm, again, I'm thinking context, it's immediately after the June 16 uprising. I'm thinking probably if I were there, I would think, you know, the end of apartheid is near, there's just been an uprising, you know, freedom is coming tomorrow, let me capture the moment before it fleets you know, before it passes by. So whiling away time, not because you think you're going to be here for a long while, but because it's, it, you know, the freedom is so nigh. You know, it's just here, it's gonna happen tomorrow. And usually we capture moments that we think are fleeting, only to learn that it would take another 24 years before actually freedom comes. So. Partly, I, I, it's a comment, it's a, a feeling that I got, a sense that I got, but maybe the question for me is, do we have an idea of what they were thinking around the, the 1976 uprising? Were they really looking at a hopeful uh, tomorrow, like a Jesus coming tomorrow kind of thing, you know? Or did they have a sense, do you think they had a sense of how much longer it would take, the okay, hardship? Th thank you so much, we thank understand you. the question. We'll try and answer it as best as possible. Um, the final question, please. Uh, somebody here in this corner? Here, in the front. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Davian Teva. Uh, panel, I address you. Um, as an education, uh, as well, someone who's going into education, I'm currently a PGCE student. Um, I appreciate what I've learned here today in the sense that 
being in school uh, through the syllabus, it's the first time I'm actually diving deeper into Fatima Mir. And I, and I really thank you for that. But my question is, um, so as a dramatic art student through school, um, we've, nev we've gone through apartheid work and post-apartheid work through our, our set works and, and um, prescribed readings. However, um, I just want to ask, is there any possible way that Fatima Mir could be part of that syllabus going forward? And is there a possibility to get that in there, especially with the artworks and the creative arts and visual arts, uh, arts uh, subjects that are, that are found in school from a grade A to matric level? Because I think this is a huge part of history and it should be a part uh, of the syllabus of South African education. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very interesting question. I'll ask the panel, uh, whoever wants to brave the first question, um, or if you want to skip that, we can come back to that later. Mm -hmm. You may wish to go to the June 16th issue, or you want to come to the curriculum issue. I mean, I, I, I can't uh, speak on um, what happens at uh, UKZN uh, managerially in terms of who's allowed together and who isn't allowed together. However, I do feel that um, the person we are commemorating today, right, was the very person who would, uh, you know, challenge those kinds of um, uh, restrictions, so to speak, right? And, um, and if we are honoring her and her work, her braveness, her bravery, um, uh, you being here and listening to that, I think, to this is, is, is testament of what you can then, you know, take to management to say, well, the very people we were, you know, we were commemorating uh, at this lecture um, spoke against the very rules you are kind of imposing on, on, on students. And that's always one way, I think, of the lessons like that Zen was saying of these figures that um, if we don't take the lessons that they have they have instilled or at least shown us in exemplifying how we can fight our, our struggle, uh, then you know, the, the, the act of paying homage to these people, whether it's Fatima Mia, whether it's Mama Madikizela Mandela, will never be you know, uh, manifest if we don't take the lessons they teach us into account. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> who would like to go on the June 16th issue? Prashanti? Uh, Yeah, I, I thank you for the question. I think it's a really interesting and important one. Um, and I think it relates precisely to this discussion we're having about time and history. Um, and I think each one of us who has been in struggle has probably always thought that that moment was the moment of change. <laughs> you know, freedom is coming now. It's coming tomorrow. Um, and I think that also speaks to... Uh, a sense of being in time, right? So a sense of how one relates to oneself in struggle, which is a very, very different sense of time um, and rhythm and possibility uh, and an idea of a past and a future than from now, today, sitting and reflecting on Marikana. I sit with an anger, I sit with a hurt, and it's an anger and a hurt about, you know, a, a, a group of uh, workers struggling uh, in, a, in a very, very different moment um, turned on uh, by a state in which they invested. Um, and I mean, the story is far more complicated, but we're relating to it today in the context of the university and struggles that many of us were part of that were lost in another moment. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm relating to the question in a, in a in a an indirect manner, Absolutely. and in it, but but I think it's important for the discussion we're having, or the discussions and the struggles we're having today. Um, so I mean, I, I I can't comment as someone from Johannesburg and Wits University on what's happening here today, uh, but I do relate in terms of struggles I've been in that I've lost in that moment where I thought everything was going to change. Um, but it's also a, 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 a sense of youth and age. And I mean, and just one, one thing that uh, Palesa Musa, the woman uh, who was 
arrested at the age of 12, said to me as I was leaving, I mean, we, we, we didn't speak for long, but I'm 50 this year, and I'm beginning to think, oh, it's, it's over. There's nothing more I can do except impart to the next generation, <laughs> getting into that kind of language. And as she was leaving, she said to me, I'll see you soon, baby girl. <laughs> and I, I'm sharing it because it's the la last while has been a struggle for me to start accepting being called mama and auntie. <laughs> um, okay. So I think it's just a relationship to time that I'm, I'm trying thank, to, thank to so speak much. to. Nanda, do you mind taking the question on the curriculum? Uh, your uh, books as well? I w just want to respond to the Marikana massacre. I did a cartoon on the Marikana massacre. I drew the politicians. I spoke about stupid men ruling the world mm. before apartheid, during apartheid, and after apartheid. I had politicians dancing on the bodies of those miners who were killed yeah. at Marikana. And that, that cartoon went viral. And I also want to say that uh, the fi there was a, something about the Phoenix Massacre. I think it'll be good if the people who were behind the insurrection should all have been arrested by now. None of them have been arrested. Oh. And then we, we have our copper pipes being cut, the water, there's sewage all over the place. Uh, everything is being damaged and cut. The people who were behind the insurrection could be part of a scorched earth policy. Because if they have not been arrested, they will still be busy doing other things. We are, a scorched earth policy means that if the country is not being run properly now, there are people saying, let's, let's do this, make them look bad so we can take over. That's how it works. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so the short answer to your question, the answer is yes. And you will, you will see just now that Professor Sidat will be presenting a book prize uh, to a student uh, based on Fatima Mir's memorial lecture. And of course, uh, that will be integrated as part of the curriculum uh, at the honors and the master's level. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I go back to Zin. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, that, that was incredible, and we thank you for your generosity in sharing your ideas. Um, Okay, we've got um, a few more items on the agenda before we close with a, a very special musical performance. Um, first, a few words on the committee from one of the committee members, um, Ms. Belinda Johnson. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Belinda Johnson. I was one of the committee members. Um, we're very pleased that this memorial lecture, which acknowledges Professor Mir's contribution to social justice in this country, has finally been successfully launched in the School of Social Science College of Humanities. We are confident that it has already become a platform that is used to continue to build her legacy for social justice. It is with great honor that the committee hosts the annual Fatima Mir Memorial Lecture. This event serves as a tribute to the memory of a remarkable individual who made significant contributions to South Africa and its people. The annual Memorial Lecture is a platform for scholars, professionals and enthusiasts to assemble and celebrate the legacy of Fatima Mir. This year's lectures promised to be enlightening and they were thought provoking as we explored defiance and resistance, Mir's cultural creativity, social capital, and artistic vision. The keynote address by Dr. Mduli sheds new light on the intersections of Prof. Mir's creativity. As we remember and honor her achievements and contributions, we've welcomed your insights and engagement, which have led to very rich discussions. Thank you very much.
Okay, I would like to next call Professor Miriam Sidat Khan to the stage to present um, the Clinical Sociology Book Prize. Uh, Professor Sidat Khan is an NRF rated scholar, one of 40 internationally board certified clinical sociologists, and serves as vice president for the AAACS and the International Sociological Associ Association. In 2023, she was appointed as the KPAX commissioner in the USA. She serves on the UK ZN's Imbokodo chairs and chairs the PFMMLC, the Professor Fatima Mir Memorial Lecture, and the Professor Fatima Mir Archives and Special Collections. Sirat Khan developed and designed the first clinical and applied sociology honors program currently in its second offering at the UKZN. Um, good evening and a special warm welcome to the 2023 Clinical Sociology postgraduate students, academics, the Mir family, uh, friends, UKZN alumni, parents, guardians, and colleagues. A sociological legacy be born in the offices of the Institute for Black Research, accompanied with unreasonable academic deadlines, has led to years of planning, submission identifiers, curriculum development and design, bureaucracy, accreditation, SACWA, board and senate approvals were by no means exhausting, were by all means exhausting. Um, in October 2021, an unknown postgraduate clinical and applied sociology program at the UKZN received 100 applications. Only 20 scholars were invited to read for the germinal degree. The program and imminent masters, um, which we're currently developing with my colleague, Dr. Govender, has received unyielding support from the International Sociological Association, the United Nation ESA representative, ARCS and KPAX. I'm pleased to report that after rigorous review, the Commission of Accreditation of Programs in Applied and Clinical Sociology has extended an invitation to the UKZN's program uh, for accreditation in 2024. With successful KPAX accreditation, we will join only three other universities in the world. The vision for a pro clinical and applied program was born under Professor Fatima Mir and Ramesh's mentorship. In the early 90s at the Institute for Black Research as a master's graduate, I had no idea what I was getting roped into. I worked tirelessly conducting research, driving, filing, sorting, interviewing, transcribing, archiving documents, and, and smuggling sugar to Prof. Mir. A professional and personal experience that thrust me into the field of clinical and applied sociology head first. Acknowledging and extending deep grat gratitude for my internship at IBR has culminated in multiple collective, local, and global efforts that undoubtedly seek to advance the intellectual project. Prof. Mir deserved more, far more recognition for her pioneering work, dismantling systemic institutional patriarchy, and her work is by no means complete. We at the UKZN and broader academic community are grateful to be tasked with memorializing the life and the work of Prof. Mir. As an early Southern woman sociologist, prisoner of apartheid, she disrupted normative narratives that dehumanized and deconscientized her and us. Prof. Mir's response to races and gendered brutality was responded with reconciliation and love for country. Her repeated reference to bluer than the blue sea, and bluer than the blue sky is indicative. Albeit long overdue, this evening, UKZN celebrates Prof. Mir's intellectual contribution to public engaged sociology. We begin in small part by writing the thorny past and complex institutional relationship with the, by inaugurating the first in-person Professor Fatima Mir Clinical Sociology Book Prize. The prestigious accolade is conferred on a single laureate 
with exceptional the theoretical, clinical, applied, micro, macro, and multidisciplinary knowledge that underscores a specified clinical intervention. This year's laureate has demonstrated evidence that upholds Mir's professional and ethical values and subscribes to her sociological legacy that authenticates a prodigious commitment to resolving social problems in marginalized communities. After careful assessment of the 2023 clinical and applied sociology candidates, I take great pleasure to introduce the 2023 laureate and winner of the Professor Fatima Mir Book Prize. In 2022, the laureate from Peter Maritzburg graduated with a Bachelor of Social Science, uh, bagging 13 distinctions. Her majors were psychology and criminology. She's currently reading for uh, a clinical sociology postgraduate degree under the supervision of Dr. Ara. Our laureate attended Deccan Road Primary School and Racethorpe High, and her research focuses on the impact of apartheid legislation on three schools in the Peter Maritzburg area. She has demonstrated exceptional capabilities and proficiencies in her research. She's developing a clinical interventions for schools in her immediate community to impact positive change. She has delivered rigorous scholarship, a complex theoretical framework, and it is my singular privilege to confer the 2023 Professor Fatima Mir Clinical Sociology Book Prize to Ms. Viyukta Diopasat. Please join me in congratulating and welcoming the 2023 Laureate and Community Change Agent. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a soon-to-be clinical sociologist, but I'm not a public speaker. I prefer to observe. I'm extremely humbled to be, to be receiving the prestigious 2023 Professor Fatima Mir Book Prize. It's never a good sign when your professor calls. So when I received a call and a personal invitation from Professor Sirat Khan to attend the memorial lecture, I was surprised. As a woman and community activist, nothing like Professor Mir, but trying every day to work to improve schooling. I applied for clinical sociology in 2022 due to whispers about a new yet highly competitive program, but it was not my first choice. I received my provisional acceptance. However, I was still very unsure because in that moment, all that I did know is that I did not do sociology as my major. And to be honest, I can't imagine my five-year-old self declaring that I want to be a clinical sociologist when I grow up. Fast forward to October 2022, I saw a call for clinical sociology applicants. It read, contact Professor C. Khan for program details. The rest, as they say, is history. After finding out that clinical sociology is multidisciplinary, I started to believe more in myself when it came to this course. The hardest struggle I faced thereafter was the topic for my thesis, as I went back and forth for days. However, I feel that is because of Professor Sidat, because she challenged us to think using our sociological imagination and recognize our community goals. I think we all just needed someone to believe in us. Thank you, Professor Sirat Khan, Dr. Ara, and Dr. Gavinda for believing in us. I'm encouraged by your extremely critical yet valued support. We are not always thrilled with the feedback and tight deadlines. However, we are grateful for the potential you see in us. We want to thank the program team for helping each of us recognize that we can make a difference. Growing up in Peter Maritzburg, I remember learning, studying, and hearing family talk about Professor Fatima Mir. 
Just yesterday, I had found out that she used to only, she used to wear a sari on a daily, even though fellow Muslims had stopped her numerous times. She fought tirelessly against apartheid. While reading, whilst reading for my degree, I was introduced to her writings. With increasing curiosity in her sociological research, I discovered her writings that demonstrated advanced thinking always disrupting traditional thinking. In February 2023, my academic journey began with the longest prescribed and recommended reading in the history of the universe. No, seriously. The program guide was no less than 100 pages. I'm really not sure why I stayed, but I'm glad I did. Unfortunately, Prof, I still have not finished my readings. <laughs> to my classmates, it has been an absolute pleasure, and I wish us luck as we approach the final submission deadline. Thanks for always being there whenever I needed a helping hand. I want to extend my personal thanks for the time the academic team invests into personal successes and encouraging excellence. To my supervisor, Dr. Ara Ramnan Mansingh, thank you for staying up all those late nights to deal with every problem we faced and for being my supervisor. Professor C. Khan and Dr. Gavinder, I personally look forward to a master's in clinical sociology in 2024. Finally, I would like to thank my sister, Diagel, and my brother, Kyle, for being here tonight to support me, my partner, Davian, for making sure that I don't give up and helping me in my tough challenges of selecting a topic, and the rest of my family and friends for always being there for me. Unfortunately, my mother is not here tonight, but I would like to thank her because none of this would even be possible without her. She's my biggest support, and she's the person that got me to select clinical sociology as one of my objects. Thank you. Thank you for that, and congratulations to the first prize winner. Um, before I introduce the musical performance, um, I'd like to call on two people to do the vote of thanks. Um, Rakshika Sibran, who's really the backbone of this the committee. Let's give her a round of applause, Rakshika. And Ramesh Harcharan, who it, it, it's a bit of a struggle to, to try and introduce Ramesh. The biography is there, and my mother actually sent me some details. But Ramesh is an incredibly important person in the story of Fatima Mir, and one day this has to be written. My earliest memories are of Ramesh and my grandmother conspiring wickedly about some idea or some initiative that they were hatching and going to lengths to, in, to, to execute it. It was an incredibly important relationship that, that I, I, I really marveled at growing, at growing up witnessing, and, and it's, it's something that will stay with me for a long time. But some of the work that they've done together was around the Institute for Black Research, which they were instrumental in setting up. It was a, it was a research space that was tasked with publishing, um, and, and publishing in very important ways. Um, Ramesh Harachan, I'm, I'm I had the, the bio, but please take the stage to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Zen. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Um, before I start with the vote of thanks, the, there are lots of side stories to those paintings that we talked about this evening. Um, one should read Prof's book, Prison Diary, uh, which gives you a background to those paintings, uh, how paper was smuggled into prison. Uh, it p places those paintings into, con into context. Uh, paper, which to us is, you know, a, we take for granted, and how important 
a sheet of paper was in prison, or a pen for that matter. And in the period that we're talking about, it was very difficult. And if you were caught with these things, you were punished further. And we must remember that the women that were at the fort were, most of them were in solitary confinement. Uh, those paintings were, sorry, I'm just going to deviate a little bit. Those paintings, these are interesting stories that need to be told. Those paintings were lodged at Bennett College in South Carolina for a while. And at the dawn of freedom, they were repatriated to South Africa uh, and, and lodged at the constitutional, constitutional Court. And the reason why they were sent overseas, that should, it, should the paintings be found out by the security branch then, they would have been destroyed and we would have lost a huge facet of our history and the mindset in, that went into developing those pieces of art which one should read in the prison diary. Um, coming to this venue this evening was quite in interesting, and it took me back to April 1989. We're at this very same venue where, when it wasn't very popular to publish the history or our experiences. And this very same venue, Prof. Fatima Mir, together with the late Justice Luis Cuilla launched three books, and that was in April 1989. And the books were Resistance in the Townships, a seminal work that documented the black-on-black -black violence of the 1980s in our townships. Beautiful book, I think your library would have it. I know we lodged a copy with, our li with your library here, and one needs to look at that and understand the history of where we came from. The other book that was published was Treason Trial 1985, which documented the, the, the trial of 16 UDF, NIC, TIC members. Um, and the, what they call it, the trialists then were Albertina Susulu, Frank Shikane, Mewa Ramgobin, Paul David, Sam Kikane, amongst others. And the other very interesting book that we launched at this very venue then was a book called Black As I Am. It was an anthology of poetry written by Zinzi Mandela uh, when she was in Swaziland. And we had it launched at this very venue in 1989 at a time when it wasn't popular to do these things. Uh, Professor Sidat mentioned the Institute for Black Research. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Institute and what it stood for then, and the role it played in developing black academia. And the Institute was founded by Professor Fatima Mir, Professor Paula Zulu, who is still at this institution, uh, the late Justice Louis Quia, lawyer Gwen Zemlaba, uh, Mama Winnie Matikizela Mandela, Professor Sats Cooper, Professor Dasta Chetty, and Roy Padiachi in 1972. When apartheid was in its prime and all anti-government political bodies were banned, the institute was a response to the failure of academic institutions then to train black social researchers, analysts, and writers. Our stories then were being told by people that were foreign to us. Our stories were told from a perspective that we did not understand. And some of them were told in a language that we did not understand. And although black students and academics were invited on an ad hoc basis to participate, participate in field research, they were rarely invited to contribute to the actual analysis of data and the writing of our stories. The Institute was founded to correct that status quo pertaining at academic institutions where, black, where a black perspective of the South African reality is expressed. This, the existence of the Institute did not go well with Prof. Mew's colleagues. It was based at this university in the sociology, sociology department at MTB, uh, considering the fact that the sociology department then was white male dominated. And here you had a woman clad in a sari, 
in a sari making a statement of making or, or cutting her own path in academia where it wasn't popular to do so. And besides having to endure the brutality of the time she lived in for her strong po political views, Prof. Mir had to contend with the persecution by the predominantly white patriarch patriarchal academia of this very same institution. And without uh, giving another main address, apologies to you, doctor, I'm going to be very short. In um, 1998, Prof was awarded an honorary doctorate at this university. And I'm just going to read what she had to say at the graduation on the acceptance of that honorary doctorate. And it's important that we take cognizance of this history and where we've come from. And this is what she had to say. Apart from the honor, this degree has another meaning for me, that of my formal reconciliation with the university. For ours has been a problematic relation. First, as a non-European student, as we, as we were referred to before the tide of black consciousness defined us in positive terms. And then, as a non-European member of staff in a white university. And she goes on to say, I share this honorary doctorate today with all those non-Europeans who went through the pain of discrimination at the University of Natal. And that is the history we need to remember, and that is the history we come from. Ladies and gentlemen, we can go on throughout the night and recount beautiful and horrific tales of our experiences as a marginalized community, but let's leave that for another occasion. The successful hosting of any event of this magnitude involves the collaboration and effort of many individuals. And on behalf of the Fatima Mir Memorial Lecture Committee members, I take, to, take this opportunity to thank the following. Firstly, the, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor M. Keyes, the Dean of, uh, what do they call it, the, let me get this right, the Dean of the School of Social, Social Science, Professor Ajong, Dr. Govinda, Dr. Sharpley, Dr. Rajendra Chetty from the University of Western Cape, Mr. Zulu, the Mir family that are present here today, the video of production, uh, the information and computer, what's it called it? Um, the uh, information, and, uh, information and computer services, uh, campus management services, the grounds team, staff at the university, alumni, students, and the clinical sociology cohort. The members of the Professor Fatima Mir Memorial Committee lecture, uh, Professor Sirat Khan, who has believed in this unstintingly and has given her, her she's a little bit of a terrorist when it came, comes to meetings and in dealing with issues, but I must thank her profusely for believing in this memorial lecture and making it happen the past two years. Mr. Zen Mari, uh, Prof. Mee's grandson, thank you for being here and being our pro program director. Rashika Sebrin, who's helped unstintingly in putting this event together. Belinda Johnson, Prof. Charlie, Dr. Desiree Manikum, who's not here but extended her apologies. Ms. Naidu and Ms. Mkunazi, not forgetting Claudette Kersival. Uh, Further, the committee would like to thank the Professor Mir Archives and Spe Specialist Collections Subcommittee. Uh, that's Professor Sirat Khan, Dr. Roshni Patha, Professor Senzum Keys, I think he's somewhere in the audience. Professor M. Keys, I've seen him here earlier on. Uh, Ms. Claudette Kersival, the Colleagues from Corporate Services, I mentioned Rashika Sibrin, uh, Sibrin and Indu Modli who had helped with the organizing of, these event, of this event. Um, in acknowledging a few individuals for their presence and for contributing to the success of this event, the organizing team had arranged uh, a token of appreciation to you and as I call you, please come up and receive 
a little gift from, on behalf of the organizing team, um, Honorable Ila Gandhi, Comrade Ila Gandhi, please come up. I'll come down to you. I'll come down to you. Um, that was uh, uh, Honorable Ila Gandhi, who's played a major role in the liberation of our country, sacrificed a lot, and had experienced immense amount of persecution in what we enjoy today as our freedom. Uh, on behalf of the Mir family, uh, Professor Fatima Mir's sister is here. Ms. Mrs. Razia Goga, if you could come up, please. Thank you. <laughs> then our three speakers that graciously um, gave up their time to be here today. I must thank you for your presence and for the contribution made in the success of this event. Dr. Dr. Nluli, Dr. Naidu, and Dr. Subban, please. Thank you. This is a calendar that Nanda Subban had printed. He's giving us back the calendar. It has a beautiful image of Professor Fatima Mir on that. Um, we'd also like to present and thank uh, Dr. Natalie Raghavan and Mr. Neil Gonzalez, who will be performing for us. If they are here, if they could come up, please. Dr. Rangan and Mr. Neil Gonzalez. Lastly, I would like to call Dr. Govinder. Dr. Govinder, are you here? For some reason, you were separated from the rest. Um, I'm, I've got in a minute or so more uh, for my time slot here. Uh, Prof. Mir grew up in a very cosmopolitan environment, in a community that she engaged in, and there were many people that she interacted with uh, in her community. And today we have one of her childhood friends, or one of the children's childhood friends, or somebody that had a very close association with the family, Danila Naidu, who has etched a painting and would like to present that to the family. Can we have Mrs. Goga to come up and receive this on behalf of the family? Thank you.
Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, thank you very much for your presence. We are now going to be entertained by, I think I'm doing the work of the uh, program director. I'll now hand over back to the program director. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Um, and thank you all for being a wonderful audience tonight, both uh, in person and online. This, uh, this event is being streamed, um, so, so thank you all for, for being with us. I'm going to hand over to the musicians to close out for us, um, after which there will be snacks and refreshment outside. Natalie Rangan and Neil, Neil Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's a very big honor to be here tonight, so thank you very much for inviting us, uh, Prof. Um, Neil's going to find his spot. So uh, we're going to do, I know you're tired, so we're going to do two songs, and they, they're very appropriate songs, I think. And the first one is uh, a song by John Lennon, and the one after that is by me. There's no heaven It's easy if we try No heaven be us Above us on the sky Imagine all the people living all in peace. Imagine there's no countries. It's easy if you try. Nothing to live or die for And no religion to Imagine all the people Living all as one You I'm a dreamer, oh, 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 but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us, and the whole life will be so. I wonder if you can No need for greed or hunger A brotherhood of man Imagine all the people Sharing all the world, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope 
someday you will join us on the way I will for love is one oh, oh, and the whole world will live as one Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the, the song that we're going to do next, I, I wrote this because it's very close to me and I know that a lot of people in this room will identify with it and what the, the song is actually saying. And it's called Africa, My Home. But my heart knows clearly Her rhythm inside me beats Like washing the waters deep Her beauty so never see I know nothing else this real Africa's my home Oh, oh Here's a sound of a hello. Oh, oh, but I do do ba 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 do yeah. Here's a beating of a soul. A sound from my window peaks. Tears don't tell me she speaks. Play by such poverty. Her children cry out in fear, but deep in her heart we hear the still hope the many fears. I know nothing else is real. Oh, Africa's my home. Oh, oh, ba ba do do ba 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 do. Do you wanna click? Is the sound of a hello? Oh, oh, but I do do ba 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 do. Hey, here's the beating of her soul. Oh, oh, but I do do ba 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 do. Hey, here's my soul to let her know. Oh, oh, but I do do ba 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 do. Hey. Africa's my home. I give you Neil Gonzalez. singing this with me you when it's your part now. Oh, oh, but I do do ba 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 do hey. Here's the beating of her soul. Oh, 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 but I do do ba 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 do hey. 
is my song to let her know. But I do do ba 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 do yeah. Africa's my home. Thank you very much. Thank you, program director. Natalie Rangan and Neil Gonzalez. Thank you very much. And thank you all. You've been wonderful. Have a good evening and travel home safe.